good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I was thinking, uh, Judy, when you were singing that, how mother or mother is spelled five letters. And remind me of a school teacher who was trying to teach their students how to spell. And one morning, the teacher was asking them to rehearse what they have learned, and uh, they couldn't get it. And so the, the teacher said, well, I'll give you a hint. It's a five-letter word. It starts with M. It picks up things. It helps you find things. And she was alluding to magnet. But of course, all of the students thought mother. <laughs> Isn't that what a mother does? A mother is more than just pick up things and help you find things. A mother is one who nurtures, loves, and cares for, and goes beyond uh, her call of duty, per se. A sacrificial love that uh, a mother gives to her child. And so I say happy Mother's Day to each mother out there today that, uh, that is here and uh, Pat is so eloquently uh, sharing in the prayer uh, a mother that uh, goes beyond her duty uh, and gives of herself sacrificially. <clears throat> Mothers teach us a lot of things, and uh, I think back some of the comical things my mother uh, taught me, but it, she taught me about, you know, uh, Foresight, she would tell me that uh, make sure you wear clean underwear because, you know, you might get into a, an accident sometimes. So she told me about thinking about the future, you know. My mother taught me about prayer. She, she used to tell me that, you know, uh, if that doesn't come out, you better pray that it comes out. So she told me about prayer. Mothers teach us many things. But the most important thing is, is they teach us about the Lord. And so today we're going to look at a portrait of a godly mother that we find in the Bible, and there are many. But I chose this one, found in Exodus chapter 2. I titled the message today, A Mother, a Baby, and a Basket. And uh, if you're familiar with the Bible, you're already know where I'm going with this. This is Moses' mother. And her name, you will not see it in chapter 2, but you can find it if you want to look it up in chapter 6. Her name is Jochebed. Jochebed was the mother of Moses. And I did some research what that meant in the Hebrew, and it meant Yahweh is glory. Yahweh is the Lord. Jochebed. She was from the tribe of Levi. As we study scripture, we find that uh, Levi was the priestly heritage that came down, uh, but wasn't at this point. That wouldn't come into play until another 80 years uh, <clears throat> after Moses was born. But we see a heritage, of a godly heritage, in this woman um, because of her actions. And you can really determine uh, someone, who they are, by what they do. Because we can give a lot of lip service at times, uh, <clears throat> but you can really uh, define somebody by what they do in their actions. Uh, just like the scriptures tell us, you know, we can... We can hear God's word, but if we never apply it, and we uh, we don't receive the blessing, and no one is blessed around us. Well, let's look at Jacobet's wife, uh, her life, and then the life of her son Moses, uh, who has come to be the man of God that was a deliverer for Israel. I would say this morning, mothers, you never know who you are raising who your child will be. And can we not just say this, that all children are important? 
All children have a plan and a purpose. Every child that has been born, God has given a purpose and a plan. And so when we can see that and nurture that and form that and encourage that, that child will be all that God has for them. So let me just read, we're going to read verses 1 through 10. We'll pray and then see how we can draw from this. And there was a man of the house of Levi. He went and took a wife, a daughter of Levi. Uh, his name was Emrah, too. Similar to Abraham, but it's Emrah. So the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him for three months. Now, as I go, I would just kind of give you a little background here. Uh, the Israelites now were in Egypt. They were there 400 years. They were brought there by their father, jo uh, Jacob, because Joseph was second in command, if you remember the story, in Egypt. By this time, some 400 years later, uh, the king never acknowledged the Israelites, and they started to grow in power. They only came into Egypt with 75 people. Now there's about a few million. <clears throat> so the king was worried about his throne. He was worried about the men that were growing and multiplying, and he needed to put a he, he needed to put a stop to that. So in the first chapter, uh, the reason I'm stopping here is in chapter one, it talks about a law he put into place about killing all the male children. He said to the midwives, when you go to deliver a male child on the stool, you're to kill him. That's it. Chapter 1, verse 14. You can look at that up. Sad state, isn't it? It's a sad state when the government puts into effect a law to remove children. For selfish reasons. Now, the midwives, by the way, didn't agree with the law. And the midwives didn't apply what the law said. So, Pharaoh, which was the king, if you just, if you're on chapter 2, just back up to verse 22 of chapter 1, it says this. So, Pharaoh commanded all the people, saying, Every son who is born you shall cast him in the river. And every daughter you shall save and live. Did you see that word? So what he was saying now, since the midwives aren't carrying out my command to abort these children, now every child is born, just throw them in the Nile. Now, that is a, a, a wrong outlook on what a child that God has created. Amen? But yet, in a society, when it's a godless society, there's no respect for life. See, every child that's been formed in the womb has been formed in, in God's mind prior to it's been formed in even the mother's womb. Every child is important to God. God knows every child. It is not something that just mutates, it's not a piece of flesh, nor is it just something that is uh, to be disposed of. And you know why I'm saying those things? Because we're in a society today that they treat that that way. And it's a sad thing. And it becomes that way because of a godless society. So where does this start? Back in Egypt, they had many, many gods. They had the sun god, Ra. They had many gods that they worshipped. Uh, they believed that the sun was the creator of things. Well, we know differently. Don't. Because we serve the one true God and Jochebed, which meant uh, <clears throat> Yahweh's glory, knew that the one true God, and she knew that she was going to spare what God calls sacred. Amen. Even at the risk of her own life. And, and I, I say this, moms, you know, your child, uh, when you <clears throat> understand that. God has given us something to mold, to form, to 
graves. Uh, that is something that is sacred in God's eyes. And I say this morning that that is something that is very admirable uh, when we put that child uh, in the place of where it belongs to be cherished. So we find here, as I read down verse 2, it says, So the woman conceived, bore a son, and when she saw that he was a beautiful child, he was a beautiful child, she hid him for three months. I needed to explain why she hid the child, because it was at risk of being murdered. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine that? You said, Pastor, why we... we we center in, in on that. Well, because we want to see that uh, life is valuable and it's sacred. And now, verse 3 says, But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrush and she dabbed it with asphalt and pitch. She dipped it in asphalt and pitch and she put the child in it and she laid it in the reeds by the river. Bank. So she took her little baby, three months old, saw that it was a beautiful baby. Uh, some of uh, the Hebrew scholars who wrote thinking that Moses' face had, as a baby had just a kind of glory on it. Uh, as a mother, as a father, when you look down at your baby, they have uh, such a glory and a glow on them, don't they? Because you know that they're, they're something that God has grand <coughs> sacred. Amen? Amen. I, I can see parents out there saying, absolutely, that's my child. Yeah. So she took this child and she built an ark. Huh. That what it said? Well, it does say ark, doesn't it? <laughs> and we know about a story about an ark that saves many. Amen? We know about an ark that God prepared so that we uh, would go unscathed of the wrath that was coming, the deluge that came upon the earth at one time. God had placed those who trust in Him in an ark. And so, uh, God's foreknowledge uh, for humanity to spare them. God always provides a way out, amen? Uh, when you can't see a way, God always provides a way. And we'll see that in this here. Uh, against the king's orders. Uh, now, you have to understand that Jochebed and her husband, they had two other children. Uh, one was, you'll know the name, Aaron, and the other one was Miriam. Miriam was probably about 15 years old at this point, and they say that Aaron was maybe three to five years old. Okay. Why is this important? Because Aaron would have missed the king's uh, law, and therefore he was safe, and so was Mary. But they were the older brothers of Moses, as you study scripture, you see that. So, the mother puts the child in the ark and sends it down the Nile. It's ironic when we read verse 22 that Pharaoh said, take all the born, newborn sons and put them in the Nile, but yet without an ark. They were going into the Nile without an ark. See, God always provides a place of safe haven for His. Amen? And so, uh, the mother put the child in by the reeds, by the riverbank, and verse 4 says, And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done of him. The sister, again, was Mary. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. She had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrew or the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. 
And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him, and the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. So she called him Moses, his name Moses, saying, Because I drew him out of the water. Father, we do pray, Lord, for our understanding of your word this morning. Pray that we understand the love that you have for us, the love that you imparted to mothers for their children. Lord, and we'll thank you and praise you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. What a twist in this story, amen? What a twist to see that here Moses' mother gave away her son in a sense to spare him. And then she got to keep him. Isn't that ironic? You give away something to keep it. Isn't that the paradox we find with God all the time? You need to surrender to win. You lay down your life so you can save it. Those who want to save their life will lose it. Amen. So it's the paradox in God. Amen. It's time to release uh, the, the things, the motives, our agendas of, of our lives. And then put God's plan into play on in our own. Life. Isn't that the, the better way? Amen? Uh, Jochebed, the mother of Moses here, uh, could have just obeyed and went along with, with what the law declared and could have just gave up her son. And, uh, but no, she had uh, a vision because she knew that God had a plan for this child and she was going to, by faith, just put this child in by the riverbank and see what would come about of it. Amen? It's releasing something back unto God. And how many know that he gives it back double-fold? Amen? Uh, we were studying uh, last week in our uh, Wednesday night about Abraham. Uh, by the way, Abraham lived about 700 years prior to this event right now. So this event that's transpiring here, uh, Abraham was, was uh, given the vision that through him and through his loins, that the worlds would be blessed, generations would be multiplied, and we understand that the Israelites came from the loins of Abraham. Because Abraham had a son named Isaac. Then Isaac had a son named Jacob. Then Jacob had 12 sons. And then guess what? The first son was uh, Reuben, the second one was Simon or Simeon, and the third son was Levi. All right, now where does Moses come from? The sons of Levi. All right, so the vision back 700 years prior is coming to pass. You see, I, I love the Word of God. Sometimes when we need to wait on what God is doing, uh, it will come to pass. So, uh, we find here that here in Egypt, where the sons of the Israelites uh, that God had promised to bring out of there, uh, how many know that God is raising someone up and that someone is Moses? And here the mother of Moses uh, is now able not only to nurse or wean this child, and by the way, you may think nurse or wean is only going to be three or six months. No. Historically, it may be six to seven years that she was able to influence that child. And the reason I say that, this is not just conjecture, because, uh, Joey, will you read from the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, uh, listen to what the, uh, the law of faith would say in Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, go ahead, Joey, let's read this. I want to explain something. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born, because they saw he was no ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. <clears throat> By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mis mistreated along with the, with the people of God, rather than, to, rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt, 
because he was looking ahead to his reward. So it's not just conjecture that Moses' mother was able to influence him. You see that he was influenced in a way that he knew from his Israelite culture who he was. Matter of fact, uh, if you know the story of Moses, when he was 40 years old, he went out and saw his brother Israelites and tried to stop them from fighting with one another. Where would he learn that? If he was coming up in the courts of Pharaoh, he was educated in all the ways of Egypt. He was given all the treasures of this world, and yet he counted that rubbish because he saw Christ in the future. And isn't that a wonderful picture of someone that has been formed and molded by another? Where did that come from? Well, I believe it came from his mother, teaching him, encouraging him at a very young age. Isn't that biblical, that what we find is that when you train a child up when they're young so they're, they're old, they will not depart from it. Isn't that biblical that we're supposed to teach a child when we go out and when we come in, when we sit down and when we rise up? Isn't that biblical that Jochebed was teaching Moses from a very long, a very young age about the heritage of God? Now the law of God was not even given yet, but there still was a law unto ourselves. Amen. The, the, the written law was not given out, which, uh, by the way, I have some theory on this which is interesting. Egypt had many gods, thousands of gods. Do you remember God gave Moses, when he was grown at 80 years old, the law? Do you remember what the first law was? Amen. And the second one. And the fourth one, keep the Sabbath holy. I like the, the fifth and the Ten Commandments. Remember the fifth one? Honor your... And it says, you see how things just, uh, how God, you know, has given the law to us. Uh, and the first five are to love the Lord thy God with our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Because if we put anything before uh, God, then it becomes God to us. And Jochebed even knew this. She knew that she was going to put God first and foremost and release that child. And guess what? When you put God first and foremost, you get back everything. You get back what you release unto Him. And so, uh, this mother is able to form, to correct. Uh, by the way, have you ever looked up the definition what discipline was? Uh, sometimes we think that's a harsh word, discipline. But even uh, we, we find that in the dictionary, the word discipline is this something, that's something that molds, corrects, perfects, and trains uh, the, the mental faculties and moral conduct. That's what discipline is. That's what a mother and a father does for a child. They mold, they correct, they train the mental faculties and the moral conduct of a child. And that's love. Amen? So that they can retain and remember that they are loved and nurtured by God, that God has a plan and a purpose for them. They didn't just arrive here, uh, they didn't just mutate, or they just didn't get here, and their ancestors were monkeys. And I don't even try to be funny because that's the truth of what the education system is telling children today. And so as parents, they're not getting it in the school. We have to tell them that there is a creator, that he created you, he loves you, and has a plan and a purpose for you. And you start to mold them and speak over them and pray over them as a young age to encourage them to look to the Lord. And so you see what happens when someone uh, rejects what is maybe popular at the time, 
and puts forth the training and the loving care that is needed to form a child. Now, not everyone uh, will become a Moses, but everyone is a someone. Everyone is a someone. Everyone is, is valued highly in God's eyes. And so, uh, this so happens, we have the testimony of the Word here, uh, of a woman who is faithful and lived a life of faith, and she believed that uh, I'm going to spare this child even at the risk of herself. Now, think about this for a minute. You know that if she was caught doing what she did, not only was it a risk to herself, but to her husband and to her son and to her daughter, the family would have been destroyed if they were caught. But isn't it like God? What happened there? Put into the Nile by the flags and the reeds. Here this, this ark is floating and Pharaoh's daughter. What are the chances by that? What are the chances that God sees everything that he's looking at your life, that he knows the end from the beginning? What are the chances of that? I'll tell you, they're very high, that God knows the end from the beginning, that God is looking over our lives. There's so many things in fear that, that do you know that fear and faith are two emotions that don't go together? And fear sometimes diminishes faith. And we need to stand in faith in what the Word of God says. That He has a plan for us, a purpose for us, to not to harm us, to give us a hope and a future. And as we stand in that faith, even though I cannot see what's going on, I trust that God has everything in control. Amen? And it's a sad thing that in a society today, we become selfish at times. If this is... And I wasn't going to go there, but you think about the abortion process in our society today. It is a twisted, immoral murder. Let me say it for what it is. And it becomes selfish because that child would get in the way of what my future holds. Now it's nothing more or less of what Pharaoh thought. These children will get in the way of my end goal of to keep my throne secure. To keep everything reined in the way that I want it. Let me say this. Control is only just an illusion. We think we might be in control. We're not in control. God is in control. But if we serve our own motives, our own, what our hands have made, then we're in for, what are we? Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. <clears throat> I don't want to leave that on a, on a, a sad note. Let's leave this on the, the good note here. The good note is that we're a family of God. The mothers that are here today and those that could make it out to service today. We understand that it's difficult in this world. It's difficult raising children, and it's difficult having to uh, even maybe go to work because we have done that in society today, that two, two parents have to be at work to uh, keep a household afloat. Uh, you know, that's something that uh, we might have bought into. And, uh, but the truth is, when we choose to raise our children to look to the riches of Christ instead of the riches of this world, they will grow up to be someone that would change destiny. 
That's how Moses was raised. Not to look at all the riches because he had it all. He had all the riches. Could you imagine that? The world was at his hands. He had everything. But he chose to walk away and choose to, to receive the reproach of the people of God than to have all the riches of this world. What is it a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his soul? What is it? And many are doing it. Because it is the lie of the enemy. And so it's a, the encouragement would be is trust God. That He's got you. He's got your moms. He's got your children. He's got your sons. He's got your daughters. He's got your fathers. He's got a plan for us. And the world would like to feed us their narrative. But the true narrative is this. This life is so temporary. This life is but a mist. Before you know it, it's over. I don't, I don't know about you, but the 50 and the 60 years just, well, I'm not yet 60. But. <laughs> I told you my heart was talking about being prophetic and speaking, you know. Hopefully I'll be here to see. <coughs> so, can you see uh, God's providence in this? Now, they were sold into slavery at this point, 400 years in, right? Here's God's provision. Put the baby in an ark, send it up the Nile, have Pharaoh's daughter grab it, and have Pharaoh's daughter to have compassion on it. Did you see that in the mercy? <laughs> then, have Pharaoh's daughter talk to Moses' sister, Miriam, and dialogue saying, go get me a Hebrew woman to nurse this child. <coughs> and guess who nursed that child? Jochebed, the very mother. Pharaoh's daughter paid Jochebed to nurse her own child. It, it's ironic, and it's the way of God, amen, because when 80 years come to pass, the Israelites, million men strong, plus women and children come out of Egypt and they plunder the Israelites. Meaning they leave with gold from, I mean from Egypt. They leave with gold, they leave with <clears throat> things they did not earn. The ways of God will always return back unto you more than you can even ask or imagine. Do you know that story? That's why this little baby here that Jotham had nurtured and encouraged and molded became Moses, the leader that led a million men plus women and children out of slavery and into the desert. Moses was the one that was given the law from God. He saw, he spoke with God. And guess what God said about Moses? He's one of the most humble men there is. Now, where do all those uh, attributes come from? Well, they come from God, but also they are formed, they're molded, and they're pressed in by parents, they're massaged in by family. What you do today will reflect what happens down the road. And so I, I just encourage uh, women, mothers, that what you are doing is very, very important. And as a man of God, I appreciate that. And I know that what you're doing each day that you talk to that child, uh, you know, we think that sometimes we've got to sit the child down and we've got to, uh, you know, we're going to teach them a Bible study and open from that. That's not the way. The scripture says in Deuteronomy 6, it says you talk unto the child as you walk along, as they get up. And on every day we reflect the glory of Christ in our lives so that they receive it. You know, many things are not just taught, they're caught. 
Many times we think that, oh, I can just teach it. No, it's caught rather than taught. So mothers, what you are doing today with your children and your children's children, because we do grandmothers, that is being caught by them, and they are going to mimic that. And they're going to be molded by that and encouraged by that. How we persevere, how we give sacrificially. And that's what Jockey Bag did. She gave sacrificially because rather than to keep the child herself and see what might transpire, she gave it away and put it on the waters and God returned him. And God wrote his name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now, how can you say that, Pastor? That was before Christ died on the cross. How many remember the, the Mount of Transfiguration? Chapter 17 in Matthew, Jesus was up on the mount. He was glorified. Guess who was standing there with him? Moses and Elijah. So we know Moses knows Jesus. Praise the Lord. Jesus is the most important one that we need to know. Because of the Godhead flows all the love that God has for us. For He loved the world that He gave His Son so that we might be reconciled to a holy God, a righteous God. <laughs> because it, it, it really doesn't matter what we have done to this point in our life. We might have made many mistakes, and I know that I have. <clears throat> we might be a parent and made tremendous mistakes. I know as a father I've been made Tremendous mistakes raising my children, but the, the blessing is that we can start fresh because God's mercies are new every day. Amen. And there is nothing that God cannot forgive if you ask Him. There may be someone here this morning who has had abortion in the past. When we bring that to the Lord, the Lord will forgive us. There is nothing that God will not forgive. There are some who carry that weight that feel condemned. They feel that they're not able to ever get God's forgiveness. I'm here to tell you this morning that God will forgive you. He wants to heal you and mend you and nurture you. Maybe you're here this morning and you put your career or things in front of your children. We get our priorities out. Remember, what are the priorities? We've learned this in our marriage series. God first, spouses, then our children. You say, well, that's kind of awful. Shouldn't my children be? No, because if we don't have God first, then we can't treat our children right. We can't love them the way they need to be loved. They can't be... Uh, nurtured the way they need to be nurtured. If we put that priority out of the wrong sequence, then our children will pay down the road. And that's why we understand that when we love God, we can love our spouse and our children in the right way. We can be the men and women that we need to be for our family. So, but there's forgiveness for that too because uh, in Jesus, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to purify us from all our unrighteousness. We can start fresh today with a new perspective, knowing that the, the child that God has put in my responsibility, that I am able now to nurture, to encourage, to start over, to, to look at that child and see that they're going to be somebody someday. Hallelujah. They're going to do something great someday. And to speak that over them, to encourage them, to pray over them, believe for the miraculous. That's an awesome thing. It's a, a great responsibility, but it's an awesome thing. Amen. I'm just getting some clarity here thinking about my own children and grandchildren that 
you know, I don't know what tomorrow holds for them, but I do know the one who holds it. Hallelujah. And to start praying over them that way and nurturing them that way and telling them that God has a plan for them and he loves them. And there is one who gave his life for us. And if we have sinned, there's one who stands in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Thank you, Lord. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Isn't that a wonderful thing that we can come together as brothers and sisters and, and know that if my life had been crooked, I say that in a way because sin says you hit the mark. Perfect. The bullseye. Like you miss it. It's, if you miss that, then we're crooked. But God is the, 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 the sovereign, divine chiropractor. Praise the Lord. He brings us back in the line. Hallelujah for that. He loves us that much. So, you know, what do we gather today? We see, we see a mother's faith. We see a mother's foresight, her love for her child, regardless of what may be for... Uh, what happened to her, and that's a, what you call sacrificial love. We ask today, as I would, I would uh, as we close, if the mothers would just stand, and uh, I would like to pray for them. If they would. All mothers, and have it all ladies. Because you don't necessarily need to just be a biological mother to be a mother. Father, we're thankful for these ladies that stand before us, O God. And we do pray a great blessing upon them, O Lord. And Father, we pray that you might bind up every hurt and wound. And Father, any past history of things that have caused them uh, any harm. And Father, let this be the day that they sense your healing power upon them, Lord. Let them leave differently, knowing that you have a great plan for them. And and not only for them, but for their children and their children's children. Uh, Father, we are thankful, Lord, uh, for they have given of themselves, Lord, uh, sacrificially, um, so that they may raise children and now maybe raise grandchildren. So God, give them the strength that is needed. I pray you give them the wisdom from above that is needed. Um, and Lord, we thank you for each one that has come out today. Allow them just to have a wonderful day, enjoying their family. We pray for the men, their husbands, uh, today that they might nurture uh, their spouse. Uh, we pray for sons to encourage their mothers. Uh, we pray for grandchildren to say thank you to grandmothers. Uh, and so we give you praise, Lord, for uh, laying these things out before us. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. 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 So John,